So I thought before we got back into the material we were talking about on Wednesday, I realized I was going to use a lot of new words. So I thought it was, uh, it would be good for me to, to at least give my best attempt at putting up some definitions. So what we're gonna talk about today is uh, simple sugars, not just in their straight chain form. We already started talking about that on Wednesday. It turns out that even simple carbohydrates have several different forms that they take on in solution that are all in a rapid equilibrium with one another. But whenever we're talking about uh, um, a simple sugar molecule that contains either one carbonyl group or one hemiacetal functional group. That's what we, we call those monosaccharides. So that's one word we're going to be using a lot. And today we're going to be, today and I would say also for part of Monday, we're gonna be focusing on monosaccharides. We'll worry about disaccharides, polysaccharides, all those good things uh, in Monday, on Monday in class. But what we mean by a monosaccharide is just a simple sugar containing one carbohydrate unit. So it will have either a carbonyl functional group, an aldehyde or a ketone, or it could also be in its hemiacetal form. And recall, we just talked about hemiacetals in chapter nine. So, uh, so that's what we mean by a monosaccharide. Uh, two of the forms that monosaccharides can take are called the pyranose form and the furanose form. And we're going to start out uh, talking with those. We're not gonna really concern ourselves very much with these furanose forms. I'll show them to you so you can see what they look like. Uh, they're not something that, get, that gets used very much, but uh, we will need to know something about sugars in their pyranose form. And so I'm going to show you both of those shortly and kind of distinguish those for you. <clears throat> then there's this term anomer. Uh, and anomers are a type of stereoisomer. Uh, let me see if I can get it out in a clear sentence first, and then I'll, then I'll write it down. But I would say that anomers are, uh, let's see, they're generally pyranoses or furanoses, and really we're only concerned about pyranoses, but generally pyranose sugars that differ in configuration only at carbon one. They're differing in configuration only at the hemiacetal carbon. So let's say two or more simple sugars, maybe usually simple sugars, but that differ only in configuration at the hemiacetal carbon. And I'll show you where that is. And we call those two forms, by the way, the alpha and beta anomers. They use Greek letters. So we call those two forms the alpha and beta anomers. And then the anomeric carbon is simply the hemiacetal carbon of a simple sugar or of a sugar. We're going to be talking mostly about simple sugars or monosaccharides. But the anomeric carbon is the hemiacetal carbon, and it also used to be the carbonyl carbon when, when, it, when in its open chain form. So again, I would recommend, and it's not gonna be wasted time because it's material that's in the same unit, but I recommend that you, uh, that you keep in touch with chapter nine in the material on acetals and hemiacetals, since that's going to be very relevant to understanding this section of, uh, of uh, chapter 16, which is the one on carbohydrates. So I think with that, we're probably gonna be good with definitions, at least for now. Uh, I've got a little more room in case I run into some other terms I need to define. But I think that will do at least for now. Uh, wow, somehow wasn't expecting to have to introduce five new terms, but uh, I find it's better for me to, to at least attempt to put up definitions, which I, which I totally get. Um, good, so uh, 
I still see people writing, so maybe I'll just wait about 30 seconds before I go to the class notes. But what we're going to move to next is uh, this business about Pyrenos and Furanos forms, which we began on Wednesday, as I said. But uh, I want to I want to be sure to cover that a little more thoroughly now. And then what we're going to talk about is uh, some of the reactions of monosaccharides. Now that I can use the word monosaccharide because I've uh, uh, defined it, I might have made the comment. It's I'm just kidding around. I'm just being tongue in cheek. But teaching organic chemistry reminds me of playing that game Taboo. Have you ever played Taboo? If uh, some of you are nodding, if you haven't played Taboo, as, as I recall, it's been many years. But the way it works is you get a card with a word on the top and several other, maybe six or eight, really, really closely related words listed below it. And your goal is to get one of the people on your team to say the word on the top. So you have to sort of describe the situation without using the word or anything even remotely uh, associated with that word. Meanwhile, while all this is happening and you're kind of making a fool out of yourself, there's someone from the other team looking over your shoulder at this card and they've got a little buzzer. And so any, if you say the word or any of the forbidden words, they, they hit this buzzer on you. And so teaching organic chemistry feels like that. If I don't define a word, I feel like there's a guy over my shoulder that you didn't define that word yet. So anyway, I know it's weird, but that's just, that's just what it, that's a little, a, a, a small look into what it feels like to teach organic chemistry. And maybe that's not unique to organic chemistry. Okay, so uh, let's go to our class notes. I do want to be sure that people in chat can see the class notes also. So it's not, I think I did something wrong. Oh, there it is. I, I can tell when people in chat can see it because it's got a green outline around it. So now I see the green outline. So I think we're in good shape. So uh, this is what I was talking about in terms of the hemiacetal formation. So here is D-glucose. That's the only one of the D-hexoses that I'm going to ask you to memorize the straight chain form. Uh, as I mentioned last time, if you know D-glucose in the straight chain form, then for my money, you know all the other seven too. So I do not see the point of memorizing all eight of them. I think, it's, I think that would be a waste of your time. If you know glucose, then in principle, you know all the others. And here I've numbered all the carbons for you. And uh, it turns out that glucose can form a hemiacetal, a cyclic hemiacetal, using the OH and carbon five and the aldehyde functional group. So it happens in what we call an intramolecular fashion. It happens within the same molecule. And we talked about that in chapter nine. We even gave an example of something that essentially works out to be a good model for glucose. Uh, what you would get if you, uh, if you took away all of the other OHs and you can still get uh, a cyclic hemiacetal. So we talked about that in chapter nine. So you may want to refer to your notes on that. But if we do that, if we form uh, the hemiacetal between the OH and carbon five and the aldehyde, it proceeds as follows. And what I've shown here is sort of uh, two separate steps showing you exactly how we get the cyclic hemiacetal form. And uh, the reason I do this is uh, I've learned from experience that uh, there's a good number of students who would like me to prove that you get the, the, the structure down here. And so that's basically what I'm doing here. If uh, maybe that doesn't interest you too terribly much, and I'm sorry to admit it, but you're not alone. It's not something that interests me very much either, but I've learned that certain, you know, a goodly number of students need me to prove that to them. So that's basically what this is showing here. It's showing here we're taking this very same <coughs> structure over here. We're showing how you rotate around this carbon-carbon bond. I guess that would be counterclockwise. Basically, the H goes where the OH is, the OH goes where the CH2OH is, and the CH2OH goes where the H is. And we turn 120 degrees or so like that, and we get a structure that looks like this. And then this OH is going to form a hemiacetal with, uh, with the aldehyde carbonyl. And so that's how you get these two structures. The reason you get two different structures is because the OH group can come in either from above the aldehyde functional group or from below the aldehyde functional group. And so there's two possibilities. We call them the beta anomer and the alpha anomer. 
and the, uh, basically the beta anomer has the resulting hemiacetal OH pointing up, and the alpha anomer has the resulting hemiacetal OH pointing down. So the way I remember which is alpha and which is beta, and this is again one of my extremely stupid low quality mnemonic devices. I have no doubt you can come up with something better, but at least I can get you started. The way I remember is the vowels and consonants don't go together. The alpha anomer uh, is the, the alpha anomer is the OH down. So you have like A and D. The vowels and consonants don't go together. Similarly, the beta anomer is the OH up. You've got like B and U for beta and up. So that's how I remember. Is, is the vowels and consonants don't go together. The reason we call those pyranos forms is because they're similar in structure to pyran, which is, again, not a heterocycle we talked about in chapter 13, but it looks like this. And I think you'll have to admit these six-membered heterocycles look a little bit like pyran. They just don't have the double bonds. So, but all of these forms that you see here, the straight chain form and both of these pyranos forms are in equilibrium with each other. So this is not resonance. This really is an equilibrium. And these things are rapidly shifting back and forth in aqueous solution. So um, we're going to be using some of these pyranose form uh, uh, monosaccharides both today and on Monday. Um, this, this method of drawing these monosaccharides, those are called Hayworth projections, H-A-W-O-R-T-H, Hayworth projections. And I'm actually not a huge fan of Hayworth projections. Do you have to memorize the Hayworth projections? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say you don't need to memorize those. Uh, there's another way of drawing them that I, I believe in the class notes. I say you also don't have to memorize. However, it turns out to be shockingly easy to memorize. So that, that's the chair form. And for glucose, it turns out to be even easier to memorize or by far easier to memorize than glucose in the straight chain form. So I'll probably tell you about that anyway. But again, the class notes, I think, are pretty clear about what you do and do not have to memorize. But uh, if you ever needed one of these Hayworth projection Pyrenose forms, it's very easy to get it from the chair form. So I don't think it's worth your time to memorize these. I don't have them memorized. If I ever need to draw it in the Hayworth projection, I just get it from the chair form. So I'll show you a little bit more about that in a little while. In addition to these two pyranose forms, there's also two so-called furanose forms, which again, I'm taking this straight out of the class notes. Uh, those form by making a hemiacetal with the OH and carbon four and the aldehyde functional group. And I again, bring you through how that works, which uh, carbon-carbon which bond we rotate around, which OH group is forming the hemiacetal with the aldehyde carbonyl carbon, once again, we have two different hemiacetals that we can form. They differ in configuration at the anomeric carbon. So these, once again, would be anomers, the alpha and beta anomer. And the way you tell it's alpha and beta is just like with the pyranose forms. You look at the anomeric carbon, and if the OH is pointing up, then it's the beta anomer. If it's pointing down, then it's the alpha anomer. So all of that stays the same. And the reason we call these furanoses is because they're five-membered rings that contain an oxygen. They look kind of like furan, which is one of the heterocycles we talked about in chapter 13. So uh, I'm, I'm already happy that we included chapter 13 and have thrown out the other two chapters, because I don't think we're going to need those nearly as much. Even though I should have edited my class notes a little bit, I mentioned, I believe, both of those other chapters that we didn't cover uh, in your chapter 16 class notes. So, of course, if it's something we never covered and never will cover, obviously you're not going to be responsible for it. But uh, I'll try to remember to point those out, but I really should have edited the class notes a little bit so they didn't include those mentions. Anyway, I don't think we're ever really going to be using the furanose forms, but I would like you to be aware that they exist. So basically, a simple sugar like glucose, and this is true for any of the other uh, uh, aldodehexoses, those other seven compounds that I said you didn't have to memorize, but it's true for all of those as well. They exist in no fewer than five forms when you dissolve them in water. You've got a little bit of the straight chain form at any given time. You've got the two pyranose forms. And you've got the two furanose forms. So that adds up to five. These are all rapidly interconverting when you dissolve the simple sugar in water. And uh, the, the way in which they interconvert is by forming this hemiacetal. 
And of course, having formed the hemiacetal, you can just as easily unform the hemiacetal. That reaction can go in reverse. The ring can open back up and you can get your straight chain form again. So uh, again, that's a reaction we know about already from chapter nine in forming hemiacetals and acetals. So uh, for us, that's already familiar chemistry. But uh, that, was, uh, that was the main thing I wanted to go over in terms of things that are already in your class notes. Um, I also wanted to go over a little bit these chair forms, since we're uh, also going to be drawing some of these both today and, uh, on, uh, uh, and on Monday. So uh, this is yet another way of drawing these, uh, these pyranose forms using a shape like a cyclohexane chair. So I did say the other day, please review the material on the structure of cyclohexane. We said it's a chair-shaped molecule. And this is another way to draw these that is uh, a little bit less distorted, a little bit more true to bond angles than uh, the Hayworth projections. If you look at these Hayworth projections, the bond angles are pretty screwed up. Uh, because the, the six-membered ring isn't flat, actually, it's chair-shaped. And so, uh, so these bond angles are not correct. Uh, and so actually, they often will draw these bonds coming off the ring, they often draw them as straight lines. It makes them look like there's a bond angle of 180 degrees, which of course is not true. So uh, there's the, these Hayworth projections do have their usefulness. We used these back in the chapter when we talked about uh, nucleic acids. And we were drawing the ribose or deoxyribose sugar using Hayworth projections back then. Although I didn't mention it since we hadn't introduced the term yet. They do have their usefulness, but uh, in many ways, these chair forms are better because they're more correct for the bond angles. So this is yet another way of, um, of drawing the, the pyranose forms. And this is how glucose would look in, in its two chair forms, uh, beta and alpha. So again, in the beta form, that, that anomeric OH is pointing up, turns out to be equatorial in that case. And uh, in, in the alpha, for, uh, alpha anomer, that OH group is pointing down, in which case it's axial. Uh, the reason I say these, uh, these chair forms are much easier to memorize is because by some stroke of good luck, and this has to be just pure coincidence, but by some stroke of pure luck, all of the groups and all of the other carbons that are not hydrogen. So this is carbon one over here, that's your anomeric carbon, but in carbon two and carbon three, on carbon four and on carbon five, all those three OH groups and the CH2 OH group uh, on carbon five, all of those for some reason are equatorial for glucose. I, I, again, I'm, I, I could not possibly believe there's any kind of reason behind it. I think it's just a, a happy coincidence, but uh, I've taken advantage of that. And so I certainly have memorized the chair forms. Do you need to memorize the chair forms of glucose? It would make me happy. We'll say again, it would warm my tiny, stony, cold, dead, black, evil organic chemist's heart if you knew the chair forms. I think you're mainly going to need the straight chain forms. I certainly would like you to know that, they, that these things can be drawn using the chair forms. But I think if you do try to memorize it, you'll find it very easy to memorize glucose because all, uh, ex except for the anomeric carbon, which the OH can be either axial or equatorial because you've got the two different anomers. But in all of the other four carbons, two, three, four, and five, all of the groups are equatorial. So it becomes very easy to memorize that. So that would make me very happy if you knew glucose in the chair form, but I think we'll mostly need it in the open chain form. So um, I think that's all I really need to say about that for now, but I just wanted to uh, make you aware of these other ways of drawing these structures. Uh, so with that, and you see, I, I was pretty clear in the class notes about what you did and did not have to know but mainly focus on the straight chain form of glucose. I think that's gonna be the most useful to you in this chapter. So I also want to begin to get into some reactions of monosaccharides. Uh, before I do that, any questions on uh, either the chair forms or these furanose or pyranose forms? Hopefully all that kind of made sense.
in which case, um, let me go back to the uh, whiteboard. Let me also close this out since we don't need that anymore. So there's all of our definitions. I think everyone's copied them down by now. Good. So let's start then to get into the topic of reactions of monosaccharides. And the great thing is these are in general going to be reactions that either we've covered already or one or two of them are, maybe one or two of them will be reactions that we were going to cover in chapter 10, which we're going to get to next after this chapter, I believe. Uh, yes, chapter 10 starts on Wednesday. And that's gonna be the last chapter we cover before, uh, before we leave for Thanksgiving. And then of course, don't forget the day we get back from Thanksgiving is going to be exam number four. And no, I'm not going to move that exam. We wanna get that done with as, as, as early as possible in the term, given that it's the end of the term. Uh, so yes, that exam will be on the day we get back from Thanksgiving, that Monday, which is it. It's Monday, November 29th. So that's after we get back from Thanksgiving. Gives you that whole time to study. Uh, not that I expect you to study on Thanksgiving Day or even Friday, please don't. Don't study on Thanksgiving, don't study on Black Friday. Do maybe study Saturday and Sunday, that'd be pretty good. Okay, yeah, Thursday and Friday, I want you to spend with friends and family. I'm gonna be doing that and I want you guys to do the same. Good, so um, let's then uh, talk about some reactions of monosaccharides. And one of the reactions that I would like you guys to know about uh, is called exhaustive alkylation. of monosaccharides. Uh, so here I'm drawing glucose using its chair form. Let's say we had it in the alpha anomer in which the OH at the anomeric carbon is pointing down. Again, remember that's carbon one that used to be the aldehyde carbon in the straight chain form. And all of the other OH groups in the CH2OH group are all equatorial. So glucose is dirt easy to memorize in the chair form. And maybe I'll just show you why I don't even have the Hayworth projection memorized. Uh, if I ever need it, I can just get it from the chair form. So here in the Hayworth projection, we draw that six-membered ring as though it were flat. Looks like this OH group is down. On the next carbon, this OH group is also down and the hydrogen is up. On the next carbon, the OH is pointing up and the H is pointing down. And on the next carbon, OH is down and H is up. And finally, on carbon five, I have to cram that H in and the CH2OH group points up. So there's no need to memorize it. If you ever, if for some reason, like in an OWL assignment, you were ever to need it, you can get, you can read it right off the chair form. So uh, not only do you not have to know the Hayworth projection, I'm gonna say, don't bother memorizing it. It's not worth it. It's just, just extra busy work that is not necessary. Good, but let's go back to the chair form since I think those are clearer in terms of the bond angles. And it turns out that you can treat uh, any monosaccharide with an excess of some alkyl halide, preferably primary. So let's say we treated this with excess iodoethane. And this doesn't have to be iodine, it could be bromine or chlorine. I'm just using iodoethane because I happen to know that iodoethane is a liquid at room temperature and bromo and chloroethane are gases at well, I think. Uh, bromoethane might be pretty close, but iodoethane I know is a liquid at room temperature. And uh, this is usually done in the presence of a silver salt, like silver nitrate or silver, silver one oxide. Uh, and the, the role of the silver salt, you'll see when we draw up the product. But the reason we call this exhaustive alkylation, exhaustive meaning you exhaust all the possibilities. 
And what you're going to wind up doing is on all of the OH groups in the whole molecule, every single one of those OH groups, you will do a nucleophilic substitution reaction. And you will replace the hydrogen with whatever alkyl group is attached to, uh, attached to the, the halogen. So, replaces all OH hydrogens with the alkyl group that's attached to the halogen, if I can spell halogen today. Right, so I would expect wherever you see OH, it would become O-ethyl. So OCH2CH3, and if I'd used methyl iodide, it would be O-methyl instead of OH. Hydrogen over here, this is equatorial. Again, OCH3CH2, hydrogen here, CH3CH2O. Hmm, I'm, I'm running out of space over here. I'll put that back in just a moment. CH3CH2O. CH2O, CH2CH3. You just replace the hydrogen with whichever alkyl halide you give it. So excess, CH3CH2I in the presence of silver one nitrate or silver one oxide. Uh, and the other product that you will get is a lot of silver one iodide. And that's, that, forms, uh, that forms an extremely insoluble precipitate. So that's, the, that's what drives the reaction forward. Uh, silver ion really, really likes halide ions and you get extremely insoluble uh, halide precipitates out. And you can filter that off fairly easily and then recover a solution of your uh, exhaustively alkylated monosaccharide. So again, basically what you do in the case of an exhaustive alkylation, you, you look for a monosaccharide over here. Uh, you should be given some alkyl halide and you look at whatever the group is that's attached to the halogen and you simply replace all of the OH hydrogens with that alkyl group. And now Owl might want you also to mention the silver one iodide. So you have to read the directions very carefully with Owl. I already know that uh, Owl uh, sometimes is kind of frustrating to students, but I've learned from personal experience actually that when students get answers wrong on Owl, uh, it's probably 95% of the time because they didn't read the directions. And, and I know that because I've done the same thing. I've worked all of these Owl questions at least at some point. And uh, I couldn't tell you how many times I would get the answer wrong because I didn't read the directions carefully. So, so I can relate, but, uh, but you do have to read the directions carefully. They generally are pretty good at telling you what you need to do, but, uh, but you do have to read the instructions carefully and, and look out for what they're saying. Uh, good, so, uh, so much for exhaustive alkylation. Maybe I'll do another example. I'll just make up another monosaccharide. Let's make this one beta. Maybe I'll leave this OH over here. Maybe we'll put this OH axial. And this has to be CH2OH, pretty much has to be. Let's say we treated this with excess benzyl chloride. Um, Stop me if you've heard this one, or, or don't stop me either way. Have, have I already mentioned that you can abbreviate a monosubstituted benzene ring as pH for phenyl? Oh, good. So I'm going to do that. The only thing is it only works for monosubstitute. Oh, that's right, because I told you you could use 66C6H5. I remember now. I did tell you. Good. So let's do this. It, you could use silver one nitrate. You could use silver one oxide. Doesn't really matter. But um, I would expect that you would get 
and I can already tell I didn't leave myself enough room. So let me back up. So you would get OCH2 phenyl. You would get OCH2 phenyl. Same thing over here, CH2 phenyl, hydrogen over here, hydrogen up here, O CH2 phenyl. And over here, you will get CH2O CH2 phenyl because it was CH2OH and you replace the hydrogen with whatever the alkyl group is. So I expect that reaction would go pretty well and you would exhaustively benzylate or exhaustively alkylate all of the OH groups. So that's what we mean by exhaustive alkylation. It means you, you look at all of the OH groups and you find where the hydrogens are in all of the OH groups and you just replace that hydrogen. It's, just a, it's a substitution reaction. The hydrogen and the alkyl group effectively switch places. And you do that in all of the OH groups, you replace the hydrogen with whatever the alkyl group is on the alkyl halide that you're given. And the halide ion will wind up forming a silver one salt. So in this case, if, if you were asked what else is formed, you would also get silver one chloride, AGCl, and a lot of it. That is if you were asked like to write a balanced reaction. Normally we don't care about these inorganic side products, but should you be asked like in an owl question or something like that, then you do also get the silver halide salt, silver one halide salt uh, as an inorganic byproduct. Good. Uh, questions on that then? I want to do two, well, one or two more reactions today. We'll see how the timing works. I'm not, I'm not going to finish this section. I, I think it's okay to be a teensy bit behind uh, because otherwise we have like one topic on Monday and I'm fine with letting you guys out early, but not, you know, half an hour early. That would be a little embarrassing. Uh, I'd rather spread it out a little bit and leave some of today's material for uh, Monday, but we should easily finish the chapter on Monday. Good. Uh, where's my trash can? So another reaction I'd like you guys to know about is called exhaustive acylation. And uh, I don't believe I've yet defined an acyl group. An acyl group is something of this type and uh, an acylating agent can be either an acid anhydride that looks absolutely horrible. I mean, my writing isn't the best in the world, but that's entirely unacceptable. or an acid chloride. These are acylating agents. And basically the idea is if you treat any old monosaccharide, like let's go back to our glucose, which again is dirt easy to memorize. Maybe I'll put it in the beta animer this time just because I can. But I don't have to pick glucose. I could pick any other monosaccharide. Uh, the same thing would hold true. And let's say we were to treat it with an excess of acetic anhydride. So I could just as easily have used acetyl chloride. I could use either the anhydride or the, um, the acid chloride. And in this case, what you also want to have present is some base, usually pyridine. And we remember pyridine from chapter 13. Pyridine was the first heterocycle we discussed in chapter 13. And what will happen is it will replace all of the OH hydrogens with whatever the acyl group is. 
And uh, in order to find the acyl group, let me get some colors over here. So here's an acyl group and here's an acyl group. So we would be taking, in this case, this particular acyl group. And uh, so this, this reaction, maybe I'll even write it up here, replaces all OHHs with the acyl group. And again, you can use either an acid anhydride or an acid, an or an acid chloride, doesn't matter which. Either of them will replace all of those hydrogens with whatever the acyl group is. And I've shown you how you can locate that in the molecule. Generally, you need some amine base. You can use pyridine. You can use something like triethylamine. That would also be fine. And in the end, I would expect that you would replace all of the H's with whatever the acyl group is that you're given. CH3, hydrogen up here, hydrogen down here, and this would be CH2O, C double bond O, CH3. So it's again exhaustive. It, 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 it at acylates until you exhaust all possibilities. That's why you need an excess of the acylating agent. And uh, by the way, one thing, I think I mentioned this in the class notes, but bears mentioned anyway, uh, in case you're wondering if there's a way to acylate or alkylate just some of the OH groups and not others, no, that cannot be done cleanly. If you didn't, uh, that's why you need to put in an excess. Otherwise, you'll get a mixture of all kinds of different acylated or alkylated products. So it's all or nothing. You can't, you can't selectively acylate just like two of them, let's say. Uh, you would instead get a mixture. Oh, good. And you know what? I'm not embarrassed to let you go 10 minutes early. It's Friday. I would like to leave the rest of the reactions for Monday, if that's OK, because otherwise it might be a really embarrassingly short class. So on Monday, we'll go over some redox reactions. We'll go over the formation of glycosides. And we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, disaccharide formation. But I think that's a good place to end it. So have a great weekend. I will see you all on Monday.